This is the 5 a.m. Miracle, episode number 496. Travel tips, tricks, and productive packing with Tessa Sanders. Good morning and welcome to the 5 a.m. Miracle. I am Jeff Sanders and this is the podcast dedicated to dominating your day before breakfast. My goal is to help you bounce out of bed with enthusiasm create powerful, lifelong habits, and tackle your grandest goals with extraordinary energy. In the episode this week, Tessa and I will break down how we managed to travel with less luggage than ever before on our recent trip to Europe, how you can navigate the complications of international excursions, and how you can get the most out of your next vacation without burning out from trying to do everything. Let's get to it. And welcome back to the 5 a.m. Miracle Studios. I am back for, get this, the 20th time with my wife, Tessa, here in the studio. Welcome back. Hi, everybody. You know, this is is a different uh, recording for the two of us. Not because we usually record when our kids are not here, but specifically, they're not in this state, which is the first time, if I'm correct about this, the first time you and I have been alone at home in over two years. (laughs) Is that true? I mean, I mean, not I mean, for a longer for period of time. For days on end. Days yeah. on end. Yeah. Yes. For short blips, we get those. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's good to have you back in here in the studio today, um, mostly because of the topic of today's episode, which is a fun one because I discuss travel a lot less than I thought that I would on this show. And it's a topic that's for those who travel a lot. Productivity and travel are so tied together, they're so important. That if you don't take it seriously, it really backfires right away on any trip you take. And if you don't travel a lot, then when you do, this has been my experience, you kind of forget how to do it well. And it's clunky and the the systems are not there and the best luggage is not already pre-planned. And like, it feels like you live in one of those two worlds. You have to do it all the time or you do it just often enough, you're bad at it, (laughs) which is how I have felt. So yeah, how has it been for you? I mean, I think think that's true. And there's lots of traveling like swag or products Mm -hmm. that you're like, okay, if I'm going to be traveling a lot, it's worth it to like purchase these things. Um, Especially if you're trying to pack lightly, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, But, you know, if you don't travel very often, it's like, oh, is it worth it to like buy this extra thing? Um, So we're going to talk here in a little bit about like what things we've purchased or gotten that we think are really helpful for traveling um, and which things maybe aren't really worth it. Excellent. So let's get to today's first topic, which you brought up earlier that I think is fantastic, which are the favorite kind of golden child of the podcast, <laughs> which are F-bots. Yes. The focus blocks of time, the things that I think if I had like a plaque of like best content on this show, F-bots is number one. Yeah. Because it's the most important thing because it's the thing that defines focus and getting things done. So talk to us about FBOTs in terms of travel. Yes. So the first thing to think about when it comes to travel is like, how are you going to get where you're going? Right. And so we recently went to Europe. And so we had a fairly long flight, not as long as, you know, to some places. Well, we had. OK, yes. I went to Australia a year ago. And it was my longest flight I've ever been on, which the, lo- the one on the way there from Dallas, Texas to Sydney, Australia, was 15 hours. Or on the plane itself for 17 hours, you know, before and after all the, you know, getting on the plane, deplaning. So it's a long time. It's most of the day. Right. That, the mentality and the strategies for that are very different than your average two, three hour flight. Right. So I think one of the questions when we were preparing for this Europe trip was like, how are we going to make it through this long flight? Like, how do you pass the time on such a long flight? And one of the things that I think is really helpful is that you can plan out F-bots for the plane, which might sound a little bit silly. But I think to sort of have a schedule, not a really rigid schedule, but some sort of schedule, like I'm going to try to sleep for this many hours. I'm going to try to get like this much work on my computer done. I'm going to try to spend, you know, this much time reading a book or what, you know, there's movies on planes all the time now. So I'm going to spend this much time watching a movie that can sort of, if you give yourself like a little schedule of when you're going to be focusing on different activities, it can help you pace yourself through these really long flights, I think. 
So one thing I noticed on our last flight, you know, we went to Europe about two weeks ago, and our flight back from Munich, Germany to Houston, Texas was about an 11-hour flight. And they had on the computer screens behind us uh, basically a schedule for the flight. So, like, you know, this will begin with a light snack and some drinks. Then there's going to be a lights out time for sleeping. There's going to be a meal time. Like, they had all these different, like, you know, the schedule for the flight, which is also super helpful if you're going to plan out, okay, when's the meal? When is sleeping? When is my nap time slash work time slash bathroom break time? You can map out your own schedule, which for a type A guy like me, I love. It's fantastic. Right. Well, and I think a lot of people have anxiety around like these long flights. Like, what am I going to do? How am I going to handle that? How am Mm. I going to keep my anxiety down? And I think one of the ways to do that is to say, like, I have a plan for how I'm going to spend this time. I'm not so tied to it that I'm going to be all worked up if it doesn't go well. But I, I do have a general sense of a plan. I have a book with me that I plan to read. I have a work task sort of in my head that I'm going to try to get accomplished that feels feasible for an airplane. I'm going to sleep this much, you know, and that can also, I think, just bring down a lot of the stress of that, like just the traveling part, the literally like traveling to get to your destination that can set you off on like a nice starting place or ending place, I guess. Well, I think too, when I think about like our recent trip, there are, you know, it's a typical international experience where it's like trains, planes, and automobiles run every possible type of, you know, apparatus of, you know, design to take you somewhere. And a lot of the trip was just waiting a lot of, there's a lot of weird, awkward downtime, a lot of being in lines to go places. So when I have the chance to do something useful and like be in charge of my time again, my control freak nature would kick in. It's like, okay, this is my time now for the next few hours. How can I optimize this time and get the most value from it? Which sometimes is just sleeping if that's all I need. Or the times it's like, yeah, I can, I can actually work right now. And then I feel good about that. Right. Well, and for the record, I do think that when you're traveling, sleep is an F-bot. Right. Oh, yes. Because there's like all the, you know, you sort of have your like pre F bot checklist. You've got your pre sleeping checklist. And then when you do it, I think, especially if you're on an airplane, you have to be very intentional that like this is the time that I'm sleeping. Because for me, if I'm like, well, maybe I'll be sleeping or maybe I'll be like doing something else, it I never sleep at all. So <laughs> to really be able to say like this is my time for sleep and I've done all my pre sleeping things, I've got my noise canceling headphones, I've got a sleep mask. You got a blanket well, with you. Well, let's go there for a second because I did an episode of the podcast about a month ago or so ago about sleep strategies. And there's like 37 of them that I listed oh, yes. out. So it's a yes. very long list of things, probably more detailed than necessary. But I think to that degree, when I was thinking about, you know, the long flight and I wanted to get some sleep, you know, we're, we're in a coach flight. Or not, this is not first class. I'm not laying down. have the luxury of that. So if you're, if you're stuck in the middle seat and coach, you know, get some sleep. I was thinking about, well, what are all the things I need to make that feel as homely as possible? And it was those things. It was the sleep mask, this awesome new neck pillow that I bought. They got each of us one of those, this extra support for my neck. You know, it was the big blanket because the plane was freezing oh, yeah. cold. We bought a travel blanket. Which I did not expect. You know, I'm very hot natured. I don't like to be, you know, hot. And the plane was the exact opposite. It was frigid. So having the blanket was essential. Well, and I think... You also, with travel, you just have to be prepared for lots of different things because on yes. that same flight, we had friends who were sitting, what, a few rows back? Maybe and they were 10 hot. rows back, and they were cooking. Yes. Which made everything super uncomfortable for them. So for them, it was really important to have layers that they could take off, lots of water, you know, <laughs> things like that. For us, we needed like extra blankets that we could layer on. And yes. that's all sort of the pre planning that needs to go into your FBOT on the airplane if you're planning to sleep, which on a long flight, you really should probably be sleeping. Which I think like to this, you know, the, the bigger point here is that this is all about being intentional and pre-planning. So if you know, for example, you're going to have a long flight, you're going to have awkward time to fill. If you think ahead, even for just a little bit of time before you leave, you can map this stuff out and get a list together and pre- you know plan your luggage and have these materials. And one thing I knew that I got to experience quite a bit on this trip was that I would have these moments of like, oh, I did pack this thing I wanted. Oh, I'm so glad I did. And that feeling is fantastic because the opposite is like, uh uh-oh, like I didn't pack this thing and now I'm just stuck. I'm stuck here. There's no solution, which is, you know, that can be frustrating, but like you can oftentimes prevent that. And that's wonderful. Right. And you also don't want to take the time. Like a lot of things are like, well, if I did forget it, I could buy a new one or find a new one. But that takes time out of your travel and it's not fun. Yes which is a whole different discussion we'll get to at the end about flexibility, which is a whole thing all by itself. Um, So the other uh, piece of FBOTs besides the airplane, which is discussed quite a bit here, would be FBOTs during the trip, which I think is kind of the bigger question of what is the trip? 
So this one we went on here was not just a leisure trip to Europe. This was a work trip through your employer. So it was a mix, mixture of the two. Yeah. And so this the question that I've asked recently here on the podcast was, if you're going to plan something ahead of time, like a trip, is it A, all work, B, all play, or C, a hybrid? And mm-hmm. my trips for me personally are always hybrids because I'm never not working. <laughs> I'm always doing something. But it's interesting because it, it does affect how you plan ahead of time. And an FBOT in this sense being focused means something different if it's on sleep or my focus is to play and have fun versus when do I squeeze in time to answer emails uh, during a trip. So how do you view FBOTs in that sense of a trip like this? Well, I think the worst scenario on a trip are those, maybe not the worst, but the ones that are annoying to me are these blocks of time where we don't really know what we're doing. Mm. I'm not totally sure if we're just like chilling or if we're going to, if I should be working. Like I get in this weird funk when I'm kind of not clear if it's like work time or play time or sleep time or what. Like if the time is to just sit on the couch and do nothing, I'm totally for that. <laughs> but it's those times when I'm like, but should I be doing something or should I not? So for me, it's really helpful to say like this block of time we have, like this is like totally leisure mm. or this is like totally work. And on the trip we just had, fortunately, it was split pretty clearly. Like these are work days. Yes. These are, this is work time and this is free time. Of course, we like booked up all of our free time with of course. touristy <laughs> stuff. Um, but it's I think it's helpful to have – In my mind, like, this is what we're doing for this next block of time. You get yourself ready, and then you do it with intentionality, even if that's resting or if that's working, do it. Um, And, of course, the traveling stuff always happens, and so you have to be willing to, like, give it up and, like, switch Mm -hmm. gears if needed. But I think it's helpful, even if you're planning, like, a leisurely trip to sort of say, like, here's what I'm doing during these blocks of time. You can sort of pre-plan, like, what am I going to need for that, and then what's going to allow me to, like, do that or focus on that well when I'm there. And I think for me, the when I think about FBOTs and the and sense of leisure, when you and I had this free day and we, were, and we were in Paris and we had planned ahead of time with a couple of excursions that we had pre-booked before the trip had started, we went ahead and booked these things ahead of time and knew they were going to happen, which gave us the sense of intentionality for the day. Like we had to be at this place at this time. And for me, when we got to, like we did a walking tour and, and one of these things, we got to the walking tour and I was more focused on being present that I had been for a long time because I could just say like, I'm here. This is all I'm doing. I'm going to fully embrace and just be present right now. And I could, I only really got there because for me, I was, I knew ahead of time what was going to happen. I had planned to do it. It was a focus block, was a focus on that activity and one where I could just enjoy it. And I, which is a different, it's a, it's a big shift for me versus saying like, I'm trying to optimize every second of the day and be awesome and, you know, productive. This was just like, just be here, Jeff. Just enjoy this. Right. Well, and I think that's, you know, when we talk about FBOTs, like a big piece of a typical like workday FBOT is minimizing distraction. So you're not looking at your phone. Right. You're not like yes. having personal phone calls. You're not changing your jacket a million times. You're just <laughs> really doing whatever it is that you said you were doing going to do. And I think that's where like the FBOT concept comes in mm-hmm. is that like we've prepared for this. We've got our bottle of water. We've got our <laughs> suntan lotion. We've got our walking shoes on. And we're just going to like really be present in this thing. We're not going to like take calls from our family when we're doing this like two hour thing because this is like our focus right now. Right. There's another block of time later that's going to be all about family. And when that's happening, I'm not going to be trying to eat. I'm not going to be trying to navigate. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be fully present on the phone call with my family or whatever. Which really, I think for me, has shifted the game for how I enjoy a vacation because I keep the focus concept with me at all times. And I want to make sure that whatever I'm doing next, I'm fully in like all in, let's do this and make it awesome, which I think has been really helpful in a lot of ways. And I think also back to this like FBOT analogy, like in your normal work day, I, at least I don't plan like 15 FBOTs in a row. There's mm. like a big one. And then there's a chunk in the middle. That's a little bit more breezy. I eat and I sort of prepare for the next, next FBOT. And then I get in and do that one. And then there's another little break. So I think for us this time with our leisure days, because we've been to many of these countries before, Mm -hmm. we didn't feel the need to pack them so, so tight. (laughs) And they were still exhausting. And so I think that's another thing to think about. Like generally with our FBOTs, we plan them around our energy levels. So you put your FBOT where you have the most energy and then you make sure that there's like a healthy cycle of of focusing and not needing to focus as much. And I think that same thing can apply to travel where you want to like – Think about your energy level, where you are in the trip, where you are in your life with your habits and all that stuff and figure (laughs) out like this is a time where I can really focus and like not overbook. 
I mean, the theme of this recent trip for us was energy management in so many ways. Because what you just said is is 100% true that when you're on any kind of a crazy excursion like this, you're just out in the world doing whatever is next, managing your energy, managing your sleep and your focus, it's all tied together in this sense of, you know, can I be here now? And if I can't, I'm going to have to find a way to rest and recover and get back to feeling myself as quickly as possible. Otherwise, I'm just going to be tired and stressed nonstop, which is, I think, for a certain for a certain period of time for that trip, that was the case. Right. And figuring out how to manage through that is a whole separate challenge, but also an important one. Well, it's so tempting when you're traveling somewhere new to want to like really squeeze every last drop out of that day or the experience. But I think if you get, if you cross the line with that, then you're just grumpy and tired and you're not really appreciating what's there and the people around you are not appreciating you being there. And it can just turn the whole thing sour really quickly. Well, I think this just underpins that less is more in so many ways. Because when you come back from any trip you're on, and you look at you know the photos and the memories of what happened. Like really, the looking back at it gives you you know hindsight's twenty twenty. The clarity is there. And when I think back to what we just did, there are a few things that stand out. But a lot of it is like we could have skipped half of what we did, and it would have been just as good of a trip, mm-hmm. but maybe even better because we didn't try to pack in everything we tried to do. And it just it's one of those where just like with packing your stuff, less is more. Experiences, less is more. You know, do fewer things and do it better. And that the quality bar then goes up, the the value goes up. And I think it's just it's so much easier to to get more from less. I think as productivity people in our normal lives, we do transactions really quickly. Oh, yeah. So like getting from place to place for us is pretty quickly. I'm going to take the quickest route. I'm going to go mm-hmm. at a certain time. But when you're traveling, especially if you're in a new place, I feel like a lot of those transitional periods just take a lot longer. If you're using public transportation, you've got to get the card. You've got to look at the map. Like that all takes much longer than it would just to, you know, drive there. It, I mean, we missed one of our excursions. We were very late to one yeah. for that exact reason, right? It took longer than we thought. We went the wrong direction yeah, on the somebody subway. Somebody put us on the wrong <laughs> train, going the wrong way. Who was this crazy person? <laughs> I have no idea. So, but It all yeah, worked out. Thankfully. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have paid for that. <laughs> but yeah, so that's, I mean, that's, it's such an important thing to realize. I think knowing ahead of time, like I am going to have to manage myself, my stress, my sleep, and the potential chaos and all of that can be minimized with simplicity and doing fewer things. I mean, really, I'm not a minimalist. I'm an aspiring minimalist in my life, uh, very much so. And so when I travel, it's an absolute challenge of can I be this minimalist guy I think I can be, both with the packing element and the time management of the activities. And all of it, I think, plays together into the sense of how do you want to approach this and then how do you want to, what do you want to extract value from this later? And for me, it's just that challenge of what do I really care about and then let go of everything else. And that it, it's a challenge. It's a hard one, too. Which brings me to our next wonderful topic of packing that I want to get into mostly because I think, if I'm correct, this was our first big trip with carry-on only luggage. Is that correct? Big trip. Yeah. I mean, obviously, trip, yes. we've done like Small one nighter. Yeah. Right. But our first big trip with Technically, no packed luggage, even though we ended up later well, no, on. No checked luggage. Sorry, checked luggage. Wrong word. We did pack it and just carry <laughs> random clothes to my back. <laughs> anyway. <that's... laughs> so we did take carry on only, and it was really effective. That was the thing I was surprised the most about, I think, in terms of my luggage, that I was able to squeeze a lot more in. This is what a 10 day trip for us. And we had, I had more than I needed, which was surprising. Yeah, we were sort of challenged by the person who was in charge of this whole trip to, like, only pack in things that we could carry on to the airplane. And it took a little bit of planning, but we did it, and I would definitely do it again. Absolutely, yes. I think it was one of those where when I was first told, this is the plan, I balked at it. I was like, no, 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 that's not what I do. Sorry, like, I pack whatever I want. Like, that's my my normal operation. But in this case, I'm so glad there was less. Because, I mean, to play the point earlier of, you know, less is more. A lot of those planes, trains, and automobiles examples were we're carrying this stuff wherever we're going. We're very much on the move. And the more stuff you have, the more you have to carry. Right. Which is physically exhausting and cumbersome and clunky and it backfires. And it's easy to tell yourself, like, oh, I'll only have like all this stuff 
some of the time. Right. Like, obviously, we have hotels everywhere we're going. So, yeah. like, I'm going to be able to leave my suitcase in the hotel room for most of the time. But when you get there, you realize that, like, the day you're moving from one hotel to the next, you have your stuff with you all day. Mm-hmm. Or if you're trying to, like, get on the subway or the train or whatever, like, carrying huge pieces of luggage with you is such a burden compared to carrying a rolly suitcase and a backpack. And let's not like kid ourselves here. Like as Americans, everything is bigger in America. Everything's bigger in Texas, I guess is the phrase. But like everything's bigger in America in general. You get to Europe, it's everything smaller, which is I think way more efficient. As a productivity guy, I freaking love it. It's a really phenomenal way to pare things down. You have the essentials, you ditch the rest. It is not just a challenge in that sense. I think it's a refreshing breath of fresh air to be able to to live on less like that. Well, and to be honest, I was still burdened by the amount of luggage I was carrying around with me. Oh, yeah. Like I had my laptop in a like a personal item bag, which is kind of like a duffel bag. And there were many times where I'm like, this laptop is so heavy because we've walked such a long way or it's so late in the day or whatever that like even with significantly paring down what we had with us, I was still like encumbered by it. Yes. Is that the right word? Yeah. No, I think that's the case. I mean, even my laptop that I love it, after a while, it weighs you down. Yeah. It's heavy. Yeah. And I, I don't view it as a big item, but it, it is. Right. And these things, they, they can tend to scale over time and feel heavier than they are. Yeah. But I do think, I agree with you. It was kind of refreshing to not have a ton of stuff. Yeah. And to be like, this is what I'm wearing tomorrow because I only have a few outfits and like, it's Which was easier to make decisions. That was the other topic I wanted to discuss you brought earlier was this idea of routines in the sense that if we, you know, you pre-pack your clothes, this is something you can do, by the way, in real life every day without traveling. You can pre-plan your life in a sense. People do this with their, you know, food for the week. If you pack your foods on Sundays and then throughout the week, the meal, you know, prep. The meal yeah. prep is ready. The same thing is true for travel. We have these outfits laid out. I only had a few pairs of shorts, a few shirts. So I would just pick one, put it on and leave. And it made my morning routine was epically more effective and way faster Partly because there was no kids there. Thank you. The other part of it was like we just had the things we brought. And so we got up, we put those things on, and we left. And that sense of simplicity is beautiful. Well, I think it's 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 simplicity for sure. But it's also like, I don't know, in my normal life, I often, you know, I take time getting my clothes on. And I'm like, okay, is this like just the right thing to be wearing right now? Like, Mm. is it like appropriate? Yeah. Is it like I try to like really kind of hit the, I mean, I'm not even super fashionable, but like I still try (laughs) to find, like I just spend time like hemming and hawing about like, what am I going to wear? And in this situation, it's like I have the black dress or the navy dress and that's it. And, you know, it, maybe I thought a bit about it before I packed it, but in that moment, I'm not trying to like find the perfect outfit. I'm just going with like my best available option right now. And I'm very aware that the people who are with me on the trip are probably going to see me in this many times. And the people (laughs) who aren't with me on the trip are never going to see me again. So it doesn't really matter. It just kind of brings you down a notch in terms of like other people's perceptions of you, which is also kind of refreshing. Well, also we're in foreign countries where no one knows who we are, which is, I think there's, the older I get, and this is kind of a trend usually as you age, you tend to care less about you know, people's opinions of you. And I very much had that same thought of like, I don't care. Like I'm, I'm hot and I'm wearing the same thing I wore two days ago and I don't care anymore. Like I'm just, I'm just here, yeah. you know? And so the the clothing choice, like when, when you're packing, that's like, you think about that a lot mm-hmm. and you're there and you're like, it doesn't matter. Like I just, I put on a shirt. And it's there and we're good. And so I feel like there's such a big difference between, you know, you think about something ahead of time, you actually live through it. And then afterwards, you can reflect and look back and say, wait a minute, there are all these things I thought were important that weren't all these things I valued that are just silly. So you can change your behavior, which I think is is helpful also in day to day life. It's like, am I putting too much emphasis on things that really have no value to me? And it it can change your behavior. Right. Well, I think we haven't really talked about this. Um, But I think there's a big piece with travel that, you know, reflection comes into play. Mm -hmm. So, like, at the end of the day, like, I would be thinking, like, did I have the right stuff with me? Did I not have the right stuff with me? At the end of the trip, I was thinking, are there things I wish I had brought that I didn't bring? Are there things that I did bring that I wouldn't bring again? And to, like, capture that, even though we may not be, you know, hopping on another international trip in a week. But, you know, to just have some of that reflection, like, about what we packed, about what that like tells you about yourself, 
Um, all this stuff, I think, is really like part of the beauty of traveling is like the introspection that you have an opportunity to do. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a huge part of it. Uh, so let's shift gears a little bit here to similar to packing, which would be the tools that we use on the trip. I mean, tools here is kind of a, a loose term, but these are kind of items that we found valuable. So I'm going to start with the noise canceling headphones because I think this is the first trip that you had them. Well, on a flight. I've used yours before. You, okay, this, yeah. <laughs> this yeah. is the first time where we're both on the same plane. Yes. Both having noise canceling headphones. So I have previously gone on some work trips and used yours. And I was like, I am never taking a flight again without <laughs> these noise canceling headphones. I mean, as a podcaster, I own like 20 pairs of headphones. I have so many. And so to get you your own pair of high quality headphones, it was like, this is this is good. I felt I felt like it was a good gift. <laughs> well, and for me, when it comes to like filling time on the plane or being productive on the plane, like I need the noise from the plane to be drowned out. Mm. And so that is like very comforting to me to like be able to like literally like block out some of the noise from the plane. It like in a way, if I'm trying to be like productive, work productive, it can help me like focus in on what I'm doing. And if I'm trying to like sleep or zone out, it's also like helps me to like actually be able to hear the movie or the mm. audiobook that I'm listening to or the music or whatever things that will help like calm me down as someone who's like sometimes an anxious flyer. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's one thing too that, and this is totally off topic or sort of what you said. The more I travel, the easier it gets. Mm -hmm. And I'm the kind of person who will just say, like, as a type A, highly caffeinated go getter. I'm also more prone to being anxious. Like anxiety tends to hit me faster than any other emotion in the negative sense. And so airplanes can make me very anxious, right, for lots of reasons. And so I think one thing I've seen quite a bit with efficiency and travel in general is the more you do something, the better you get at it. And then we can find tricks and tips for yourself that help you get through something. And for me, like the, to the example of headphones, like being able to drown noise out, listen to a podcast I love or watch a movie or whatever the case is, like it just it puts me in a zone where I can just kind of be myself and feel good. And those other thoughts might kind of fade over time, which is has been helpful and right. worked well. When I don't, you know, I love a good F bot. So I feel like I can just keep going back to the F bot. Yeah, yeah. Part of the thing about the F bot is you let other people know that like I'm in a I'm in a focus block of time right now. And yes. I think the headphones, especially these big noise canceling ones that everybody can see are such a visual cue to other people that like I'm in the zone. Mm -hmm. I don't need you talking to me right now. And I think. That's just really helpful on the airplane. Definitely. The next tool I wrote down that I thought was really essential, this is the two of us love these things, our eye masks that we use yes. for sleeping, uh, which I saw more of those on this trip than I've seen in previous trips uh, from other people, but I found those to be absolutely necessary. It's no longer like a frou-frou item. Like, I feel like an eye mask is required. Yes. When we were packing, we were like, do you have enough? Do we have enough? Do we have a backup? Are had, you bringing a backup? Am I bringing a backup? Yes. <laughs> but I think all this points to this idea that, like, we value sleep and we're going to prioritize it. And we know that, like, to be our best selves, we have to sleep. I need it even more than you do. And that, so I think that's just one of the pieces that's like, for me to have a good day tomorrow, I need to sleep well today. Mm. And that means that I cannot take this entire flight and all day tomorrow and not have slept at all. Um, so I think it's just, again, kind of planning for like what you know is going to set you up to be in a good mood tomorrow. Totally. And they work well. Well, we've changed brands on those recently. so I'm... Well, because the brand was discontinued. I know. It's frustrating. Yikes. So I don't yet have my like go-to brand anymore. We're just going to use the ones we have. We're going to figure it apart. out. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get, yes, we'll get there. Um, the next tool that the two of us loved was the Google Translate app on our phone. If you travel internationally, especially somewhere where the language is different than yours, holy cow, this app was amazing. And so I knew that there was this thing called Google Translate. I, When someone's like, use the app, I was like, okay, awesome. Well, like, I've used I it before, yeah. but like intermittently for random words, not for what the app can do, which is to translate everything in real time right in front of you. Um, this is, I guess, the joy of AI technology and what this app can do. I'm sure others do it too, but this one we used. Um, so if you are in the middle of a foreign country and you hear someone talking, like in our case, we're on a bus with a tour guide who was speaking German, and I busted out the app and I hit go and it listened to her speaking and then translated it to English for me on the phone so in as, real time. Yeah, as quickly as she's talking, I mean, there's a bit of a lag, but as quickly as she's talking, we can read exactly what she's saying. Yes, and it was mind blowing. Like <laughs> just yeah. super helpful to have. The other thing that's helpful about this app is you can like open up as if you're taking a photo mm -hmm. and like hold it up to a menu or the sign outside of a building and it'll sort of overlay in your language what it is. So you can see like, are there any items on this menu that 
which I believe you would call the AR augmented reality feature. Yeah, okay. That's basically what it is. So it's giving you a sense of like, here's like a digital world laid on top of the real world. In that sense, it was like changing the language for you right there on the phone. So if you see this like fancy building with a sign out front, you can hold up your phone and be like, oh, this is like the Museum of Natural History, right. which you wouldn't have noticed or you wouldn't have been able to tell if you don't speak the language. You can't tell what the signs say. Right. Which is great. Uh, next tool that I think both of us had some issues with that previous trip uh, were the dual voltage devices, yes. um, which is so critical. So if you are, let's say, an American, which odds are, based on my data, you are an American listening to this show. But if you are, if you are, you don't deal with this very often. Uh, if you live in other countries where you change voltages, it can be a nightmare if you don't have this set up ahead of time. All this really means in, in very simple terms is that things like iPhones or uh, fancy computers that cost a lot of money, which is most of them these days, they come automatically with this feature. And all you need is an adapter for the actual plug and the outlet, and then you're good. However, if your device is not, it's a single, like, designed for your country only, and you go to, I don't know, from the U.S. to Europe, and you plug in what I did before, your white noise machine or your hair dryer, it will start on fire. <laughs> because, the like, the volts coming out of the outlets in the are other way countries higher. are way higher than they are here. They're twice so as high. you can't just put... This I don't the, even think I knew this. This but is you, a 110 in the U.S. There's 220 in other places. You'll end up zapping your devices to death. Right. And I found, my experience at least, is that those, like, um, converters just don't work very well. Like, if... Converters are really dangerous to use. I think they're use. supposed to work. They, I've had really... I've had major problems with those. I, I find the answer is you buy a device that natively has that built in. Yeah. So, luckily, like, most modern cell phones, computers are all good. My Garmin watch is dual voltage automatically. So those ten, those are fine. Um, it's the the cheaper devices where you get really finicky results. Right, like hair dryer, straightener, yes. curling iron, curlers, like all that stuff that many is women risky. I think are like <laughs> I have to have this. Yes. My advice is like pick one. Like obviously you want to do your hair when you're on your trip. That's fine, but like try to narrow it down so you have one thing, one device or instrument or tool or whatever, and then make sure that that one is already dual voltage. That you're yes. not messing with the converter. You're just Maybe you have to deal with an adapter so that it'll actually plug I mean, the in. The adapter is going to be required, but that should be way easier then. And the other cool thing is that so much more of the world now is USB based. So any device you have, you want to you know, charge your phone, there's likely to be a USB charger available. Um, I have heard some security warnings about that recently, so maybe it's not the best idea. Uh, but for the sake of convenience, USB plugs are super handy. Okay, I just thought of another fun tip, Ooh. a little travel tip. There we so, go. If you lose your adapter or you forget it in the hotel room and you go to the next hotel and you're like, what am I going to do? I don't have an adapter. Odds are that they have a whole bunch of adapters there that other people have left in their hotel rooms. So this happened to us. And when I went I down. I was just going to say, this sounds like you're talking about experience yeah, here. <laughs> this happened to us. But when I went down to the hotel, the second hotel, and I was like, hi, like I left my adapter in the other hotel. The guy at the front desk basically was like, well, someone has left an adapter here for you as well. So... <laughs> It was, and they had this huge box, and I could just rifle through it and find the one that fit my device, and it was great. And then I gave it back at the end. You know those times when people go through like a drive-through window, or like, please pay for the person you know yes. just left, yeah. or the person behind you, you know, pay in line. That kind of like, what do you even call that? Like but pay it forward, pay it forward kind, kind of thing. concept. It felt like that to me. We're like, we left our adapter in Paris. We get to Munich. We're like, oh, there's a whole box of adapters here for us left to for choose it. from. Yeah. So it works out, yeah, pretty nice in that sense. Uh, and the final device I kind of mentioned earlier, the tool, uh, was the white noise machine. This is goes back to sleep once again. It's the, of, of all the things we did in this trip, one thing that we you know really nailed down was, here are the core things we love. Here are the things we value, we absolutely want to have with us. And to be able to drown out the noise of a new location, I think for me is helpful, not just because I like white noise machines, but because I don't sleep well in new places. If I change mattresses, I change rooms, I change houses, change countries, I just, it takes me a while to adapt. And so if I could have something that kind of zeroes my brain in on like, this is normal and comfortable and familiar, I'm way better off. It goes back to this idea of, uh, you know, packing only what you need. So to be able mm -hmm. to like look at your own life and figure out like this is the thing that's going to make me feel comfort when I need it. And can I fit it into my two carry-on items? That's why it was such such a game changer for us because 
my initial thought was like, if we're only going to pack a few things, we're not going to bring that, the white noise machine, which kind of feels like a luxury. But I happened to find one that was designed for travel that's dual voltage out, out of the box. So it was fantastic. So it fit and, and USB charging available. Oh my gosh, like yeah, all the things I just mentioned. Everything. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, the next big thing I want to definitely hit up is the flexibility concept, which we've kind of discussed a little bit here. But it's one that I think needs to be almost like reiterated to the point of on this trip we were on, there were some people who I would call like newbies in terms of travel. Like this was one of their you know first big trips. This was a challenge uh, or just it, it was new in so many ways. And the first thing you know when you travel is that flexibility is like absolutely required at every stage. Because everything you planned is going to be messed with in some way and challenged. And I feel like it's just, there's a mental game you play of how do I like just ease myself into the next whatever is happening. Well, and I think it's a good point to bring up because we're having this whole conversation about like how to be productive and how to have a schedule and how to have exactly what you need when you need it all the mm-hmm, time. Mm-hmm. But like that is in combination with like a heavy dose of flexibility, adaptability, um, just kind of like a breezy attitude. I mean, between canceled flights and weather problems and, you know, it, you know, lack of sleep and, you know, your hotel is not available yet. It's like this, every problem you can imagine will in some way happen in some form or another. All these things are there and being able to ebb through them in a way that doesn't make you crazy is, is it's necessary. Well, and I think that's part of the joy of traveling. Like if I mm. wanted to have every single thing I needed to make me comfortable mm. and I wanted to know exactly what I was doing every moment of the day, I would just stay home because I have <laughs> all my comforts here and I have my schedule set. But like part of like why traveling can be an educational experience is because you are confronted with mm. new situations and opportunities to be adaptable and you're outside of your comfort zone and you're often hot or cold or hungry or sleepy or whatever. And you learn a lot about yourself when it, like when you're in those situations, like who am I when things are not going my way, when things are not like planned perfectly. You know, one thing I thought is funny that has happened to me a lot in my life is that people who are on our trip would say, well, oh, Jeff knows what's going on. Like, he's walking really confidently in this direction. Let's follow him. I'm like, oh, me? I'm just wandering aimlessly <laughs> around. Like, I, don't, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I look confident, which I also find to be an interesting kind of, I don't the way that I tend to go at the world is I do, I walk quickly with a purpose wherever I'm going, even if it's the wrong direction. I'm like headed there with confidence. And I think with travel, I, I like to have that sense of like, I do have a plan in some way to perform or I'm going to make up on the spot and just go and go with it. And I think that's helpful as opposed to just kind of throwing your hands in the air and be like, I don't know. It's terrible. Ah, which I, it doesn't tend to work for me. I like the sense of like, I'm going to figure out something here yeah. and make it work. Yeah. Being resourceful is one of your key skills, I think. Well, I think, yeah, it, it, which is helpful in those scenarios. But I think also not wallowing in, you know, when something doesn't go right or when you get a meal that you're like, wow, I don't want to eat that at all. Or, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm freezing or I am so tired. I just don't want to sit through this part of the trip or whatever. I think to not wallow in that and just sort of be like, well, I'm here and we're going to watch this movie or I'm going to get something to eat later or whatever, you know, that well, kind I mean, of. And even the whole topic of food. I mean, if you listen to this podcast for a while, you know that I've been a vegan for 13 years and traveling as a vegan has its challenges, right? It's not the easiest thing in the world. People on our trip were gluten-free. People were diabetic. People had medical you know, challenges. Like we, you come as yourself with whatever is going on and the adaptability to make that work wherever you go is in of itself another layer of, okay, I'll figure this part out too. And you can, you always can. And that's the, the message that I got over and over again was like, you will find an answer. If you're looking for one, you'll find one. And I think that's, it's comforting to know that like, there's going to be something just, have the patience to be able to get to that next thing. Yeah, But that's, again, like that's part of the reason that we put ourselves outside of our comfort zones. Exactly. The challenge is healthy. Okay. The other component I want to tackle here was the very last piece that you asked me this question earlier, which was what made the trip better or awesome? Which I thought was a really good question because this kind of plays back to my green pen strategy that I've discussed in my second book, The Free Time Formula. And the green pen strategy basically asks the question, as opposed to trying to figure out what went wrong and how to fix it, it's what went right and how do you amplify your successes and things that are awesome and have more of those. Uh, to that degree, Tessa, let me ask you this question. What do you think from this last trip, you, you could d- draw from it, you want to amplify more of, like what was what stands out to you as a success? In terms of traveling? 
Sure. Yeah. That's the topic of the show. <laughs> well, I mean, I think there are like bigger life lessons that you can take away that are not okay, necessarily yeah. related go, to traveling. But no, I'll go travel because that seems easier. Cool too. We can theorize. Yeah. I mean, great. I think it's a lot of the stuff we've talked about. Like, I think not having too much stuff was really helpful. Yeah. I think having a nice balance of planned stuff and not was helpful. Um, one thing that I have to do, which other people probably do too, is I have to be careful with what I eat because I get an upset stomach sometimes. Mm, and yeah. I, my tendency when I'm traveling is to like, especially if it's a enjoy new country, everything. like I want to enjoy all this stuff. But I had to be aware of like, okay, let's not eat stuff that's like crazy outside of the zone because I want to enjoy like the rest of this time, the rest of the day. Which tied to that, we discussed the app that was recommended to us, which is called Flush which tells you about local toilets that are available. So wherever you go, you can, at some level, figure out where you can go to the bathroom, which, when you're traveling, is a part of your experience. A uh, big part of ours. I tend to drink a lot of liquids, and so I need the restroom more often than uh, than most. Yeah. So I think for me, like, managing, like, how much I'm eating or what I'm drinking or when I'm drinking it, like, all that stuff. Well, that was going through my head all the time, was if I make this choice here to eat this food, drink this drink, whatever I'm going to do next— how will that impact the next few hours of my trip? Mm-hmm. Where, where am I going to be? Will I have access to things I need or not? Like those kinds of thoughts are going through my brain constantly. Right. So it's a real sense of awareness, a, right. a very heightened sense well, of that. And it's also like constraint a little bit. Like as much as yes. I would love to like have another coffee, when I am over caffeinated, I'm not happy. Mm. And so I need to be aware of like what I'm drinking for breakfast, you know, my breakfast coffee even though we're in Paris and like coffee is such a big thing, you know, I have to be thinking around like, okay, I need to show a little bit of constraint here so I can have a better, you know, rest of the morning. Yes, which is huge. Um, in terms of that question back to myself about what made the trip really awesome, one of the, the first thing I thought of was Tessa, oh. was you. And I said that at first, I was like, well, that's just like, saying that because I'm well, right here. <laughs> my, at first, I was thinking, well, that's just a silly husband answer, right? That's, that's, what, that's what I should say. That's great. But then I realized like that actually is the answer, which is what made things better for me was a trusted person that I was traveling with, which you call a travel buddy. A travel buddy. <laughs> um, in our case, it's a spouse, but it could be you know anybody who you trust that you spend time with. You say, hey, hold my bag while I go to the bathroom. Watch my stuff while I go over here. Or like, let's just work, you know, brainstorm a, a solution to a problem together. Like you just have someone you can speak the same language to and be able to navigate to the next area. It was huge for us. Yeah. And I have found that like when I have, you know, gone to conferences or trips or whatever by myself, I, I feel like we always hit this point where it's like, are you going to come? Do you want to come? Should we try to make mm-hmm. you, you know, should we try to make this work with both of us going together? And often the solution is no, it's better to just, you know, logistically for one of us to go at a time. But in reality, it's so much more enjoyable to be with someone who you feel like you don't have to have a filter up. You don't have to be like super professional all the time. You can mm-hmm. really just be like, you know, I really have to pee. Like, can we just <laughs> yeah. stop what we're doing now and find a bathroom? Because, like, I've got to go. You know, something that yeah. you might not um, be able to do as easily on your own, and you might not be willing to, like, divulge to people who you're not so, you know, in a good relationship with. Yeah, it's, it's huge. Uh, the next thing that I thought of is, of course, as a detail-oriented, high-achieving, like, you're like, you know, data nerd, having an itinerary ahead of time for me was both helpful in the planning stages, but super helpful in the moment. So when I was, you know, traveling through a new country, asking the question, you know, how much time do I have where I am? What's the next activity? When does it happen? When do I catch our next train or next flight? Having my itinerary on my calendar, on my phone was huge. And then tied to that was this trip, we had cell phone and data access on our phones. The previous trip, our carrier at the time, Somehow it didn't work. We got to London our previous trip and we had no cell phone service except in Wi-Fi spots. And it was infuriating for someone like me to have to go through. And then so blissfully simple this time around because we had simple access. It was easy and affordable and awesome. And it's a game changer, especially in those environments where you need a map and you have to know where you're going. That's really what it is. It's the map. So like, I don't consider myself like a heavy technology user. Like I don't, know where my phone is at the moment. Oh, there it is. <laughs> um, but like, I don't, you know, I don't have my phone with me every moment of the day. I don't use lots of like programs and all this stuff. But like, I don't like being lost. Mm. I like knowing where I'm going. And especially in the countries where the language is different and the signs are not easily like readable. Mm-hmm. It's so helpful to have a map. 
Yes. And to have a map, you need to be like constantly streaming. Is it streaming data? Is well, that the way to say it? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, my phone's battery was dying constantly. That's, that's the key thing I forgot to bring on this trip was an extra battery charger for my phone or having a spare battery with me because my phone was being heavily used by the GPS and Google Maps, my favorite app on my phone by far. And I used the heck out of that thing because it was just a constant question of where am I? How do I get to my next you know, bus stop or train station or where am I going next? And so I was looking at my little blue dot, where am I in the world now? And it was so valuable to have. And without, it would have caused a lot of problems. Well, it's actually, it's much more freeing to have that because you know, like if we decide to take a detour, like we'll be able to get back. If we walk a little bit too far and get tired, we're able able to call an Uber or whatever it is, you know. Though it sounds kind of, I don't know, flippant maybe to be like, I need my technology with me all the time. But like, we're not talking about like scrolling through, I don't know, TikTok videos or whatever. We're talking about like... (laughs) essential travel things that now are like essential parts of traveling i mean i say all this like i have been to europe was almost 20 years ago now with no iphone no technology like that i just did it like it sounds like i'm very old in this statement but like you can live a life without a phone but with a phone man it's just so much better so i think especially if you're trying to go like we did what four countries in 10 days like Mm -hmm. to to go in really quickly and to be able to navigate is really helpful so to that degree, I think tech then allowed us to pack more in faster, mm-hmm. uh, where otherwise it wouldn't have worked that way, which, I mean, either way is fine. It's just like, you know, once again, your comforts, what's mm-hmm. going to allow this to be easier and, and prevent problems? So that was ac- excellent for us. Um, that was it. That's the, I don't know, the gist of it. What else do you have as far as takeaways from this? I mean, I think the big takeaway is traveling is good. And there is a huge difference between traveling, for me at least, between traveling to, like, my loving family than there is traveling to, like, a totally new place. And I think my inclination often is to just kind of, like, be comfortable and be, Mm. you know, go to the same place that I always go. Go with the same people that I always go with. Do the same things over and over again um, because it's not quite so draining. But, like, while it's draining, I think there's still so much you can learn about yourself and about the world through traveling that you just don't get by doing the same things over and over again. There was a topic on the show, I forget now when it was recently, where I was discussing on accident this concept of disruption, where I was realizing the best thing for me is to not do the same thing again. It is to disrupt my habits, to disrupt and burst my bubble, is to see things from a different perspective, which you just cannot do if you do the same thing every day. Like you have to, at some point, just intentionally get yourself out of that rut that it becomes. Like a good habit is still a habit, which means it has a potential to become a bad habit over time if it's never readdressed, right? If you don't never have the chance to like see it from a new lens and traveling forces you to rethink, what do I eat? When do I sleep? Who do I talk to? What do I value? You know, how do others see the world in a way that I, th- I don't yeah. see it? I think it makes you think like, you know? who am I? And like, what yeah. am I contributing to like like my life in the world and like how are people like different and the same, like across the globe, that perspective is huge. And I think for us, especially in this phase of life where we are with our children, where we're not going to take our children on an international trip anytime (laughs) soon, um, you know, to have had this opportunity to travel together has been just so amazing. And I think, you know, if I have, if I have any say in it, like we should plan something like this again, to make sure that like we're able to like disrupt our our sort of very structured schedules because you just never know what you're going to get out of it. You never know what you're going to get from traveling. That's true. And that's that's the good thing about it. I mean it's the intentional like I'm going to throw myself in the deep end of the pool and I can barely swim and let's just figure it out. And I think that it takes I mean certain personality types uh, love that and some hate that. I think either way, it's healthy and good. Mm-hmm. And it leads, it's, it's, I think in a lot of ways why I really fell in love with running marathons, especially trail marathons, was because I could go get lost in the woods for a while and then just find my way back. And that's what it feels like. It's like this exploration, this adventure, this safari you're going on, metaphorically or literally, <laughs> you can go on these things and then figure it out. And the journey and the joy of all of that is just so profound. And it's just such a, a, an experience that, like, if you drive to and from work on the same path every day, I mean, man, that gets old. You know, regardless of how awesome you love your job, it doesn't matter. It, it gets old. And being able to disrupt that with some, you know, the flexibility of travel is, yeah, it's epic. So, Tessa, 
Thank you for traveling with me yes. as, a, as a life uh, travel I buddy. It. Yeah. I love that. And uh, I'll be back on the show sometime soon. I don't know when, thank but uh, this is your 20th time. So Yay. thank you for being the uh, most frequent guest on the thank podcast. You. We just hit the 10 year anniversary of the show. Last week, we celebrated the 10 year anniversary. And I, you know, I made this kind of not a promise, but basically this. I threw a thought out there that I'll be on this podcast the next 10 years. And the very first thing that I thought was like, I'll be here with Tessa for the next 10 years Aww. doing this show. And it's like, part, even people ask, ask me this question all the time. Like, how do you create content for a show for 10 years? And I was like, I don't know. I just kind of make it up. Like, I, just kind of, I show <laughs> up and just, it just, yeah. it comes to me. But like, if you live a life that creates newness, freshness, I mean, travel is the best example of that. You have a ton to talk about. Like you can, your life is an expression of the things you do. So go do more fun, awesome things. Yeah. And that's great. That's great. So anyway, love you. Love you. Thank you. <laughs> And for the action step this week, plan your next trip right now and plan to bring only the essentials. Traveling efficiently is not just for the pros. It's really the only way to keep your sanity when you're bouncing between trains, planes, and automobiles all over the world. So buy a great carry-on suitcase and practice packing it now to guarantee you have only what you need the next time you're on the road. JeffSanders.com slash 496 is the place to go for the episode notes. And of course, subscribe to this podcast or follow in Apple Podcasts or Spotify. That's all I've got for you here on the 5 a.m. Miracle Podcast this week. Until next time, you have the power to change your life. And the fun begins bright and early.